Hey, um, good afternoon, everyone. Very excited to be here. Thank you, HashP, for putting together this uh, amazing panel. Today, we are talking about one of the most important breakthrough in the blockchain history, I think. Uh, we're going to talk about restaking. Uh, but before we go into details, right, I want to do a quick survey. Um, here, how many of you have own if? Could you put up your hand? Okay, and how many of you have staked your if? Cool, that's some of you. And how many of you have restaked your if? Nice, nice, nice. So we're going to kind of have a half half situation where we have <laughs> you did not. <laughs> anyway, um, so we're going to have a half half situation here. Um, today I'm super excited because uh, I would say we have all the most important people on this panel um, in the in the restaking uh, place. So first we have Surim, uh, founder of Aganea, which basically invent and pioneer the idea of restaking. And then we have Atevik, co-founder of Babylon Chain, which bring restaking to other chains like Bitcoin, not just Ethereum. Uh, we have Dorothy from uh, Odd Layer. And then we have um, Lucas from Ransom Protocol. And last but not least, uh, Ranvier from Witness Change. Cool. So um, why don't we start with the, the most basic questions, right? Um, what is restaking, right? And what would be the, there's no other better person to answer this question than, you know, Surim himself who basically pioneered and implemented this, uh, this idea. So what's, what is restaking? How does it benefit uh, projects and users? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Jason. Really excited to be here. Uh, what is restaking? What is staking? Take your digital asset, lock it up, make a promise that you're running the validation of Ethereum protocol correctly, for example. And that is called staking. You're putting your digital asset at stake and promising that you're running the services correctly. Either you run it yourself, you may delegate to some operator to actually do it for you. So that's staking. What is restaking? Um, this word became very popular, but I think conceptually, what is easier to understand is general purpose programmable staking. What is this? You know, when you stake your ETH, you're making a promise that you're running the Ethereum protocol correctly. Can you also make other promises that you run other protocols correctly? That is the core premise of restaking or Eigenlayer, which is a protocol which is building restaking in the Ethereum ecosystem. The idea of restaking is that now, because you have the same stake, can now validate all kinds of other services, it reduces the barrier for developers to build and deploy new decentralized protocols with very low friction. So I come in, I create a new protocol, let's say it's an Oracle, let's say it's an AI processor or a fully homomorphic encrypted service, any of these things, now I need it to create my own trust network, a group of nodes and a stake that goes along with it that actually validates that service. Now with restaking, that becomes commoditized. Anybody who wants to build and deploy new services can come in and access the pool of trust that already exists in Ethereum to now do all kinds of other things. This expands the scope of what services can be built and deployed and used with security in the uh, crypto landscape. Cool, thank you, thank you. That's a very good um, definition. So what makes Restrict uh, Eigenair so special is that it's an actual infrastructure that allows different people to further build on that and build on the idea, idea of restaking. And one example is Ransom Protocol, which uh, basically invented the idea of liquid restaking, right? So, uh, Lucas, could you explain to, or describe to us what, it, what does it mean by making restaking liquid? Like, how would that uh, be important to the ecosystem? Yeah, one of the most important things of any ecosystem is liquidity, uh, especially when it comes to Eigenlayer. So uh, there's going to be a number of ABSs, dozens of ABSs running, and the most important thing for them on the, the demand side coming in is being able to have the liquidity that they need to be able to provide uh, security and services for, for their clients. And uh, at Renzo, uh, our goal from the very beginning has been to um, make it as easy as possible. Uh, and the way we do that is we aggregate capital uh, or Ethereum, bring it into Eigenlayer, stake it, and restake it, making it extremely efficient for AVSs to be able to source that capital. Um, at the same time, though, 
when we think about liquidity, one of the most important things that we um, all need to be very aware of is the, the very LRT or with Renzo, Easy ETH, the liquidity of the, the actual token is uh, fundamental to the security of the services that are using it. And the way to think about it is its stability, right? If you don't have a stabil, uh, stable asset or a liquid asset, um, then you don't have trust. And if you don't have trust, then AVSs uh, don't have uh, the security and the liquidity that they need to be able to uh, support the services that they do. So uh, at Renzo, um, we have an amazing team and we've been killing ourselves for months to make sure that we fundamentally focus on liquidity. So we do that in a number of ways. Um, the first one, the, the way we started off was really focusing on uh, DeFi integrations on mainnet. That's anything from DEX liquidity. Um, when you think about DEX liquidity, when you swap in and out of an asset, you don't want to lose value. So having very low slippage um, really gives uh, an asset that stability and the trust that's needed. And then we've expanded out uh, by integrating with other protocols. And one of the most important things that we're really excited about is the same services or roll-ups that are using Eigenlayer to help bring down the cost. Um, we've built out an integration with our partners at Connect, and we're, what Renzo is able to do is allow for users to natively restake on a roll-up. What that means is you're able to take ETH that you have on Arbitrum, on Mode, on Base, on Blast, and these roll-ups and be able to deposit it and add to the net security that uh, AVSs on Eigenlayer are getting without fragmenting the liquidity and making it extremely efficient. Um, so. That's, that's really great. Um, I, I, I really appreciate the point that when you mentioned liquidity itself is a form of security and make the users more, a lot more comfortable to basically restrict the token and have low slippage when they're actually en engaging with the service. So great, thank you. Um, so uh, other than Renzo, another example that has actually built a service on Eigenlayer is uh, Witness Chain. So Renvia. Um, we know, I know that Venus Chain has uh, built an ABS uh, which is focusing on DPIN, right? So just curious, why do you choose uh, DPIN as the sector to focus? What kind of use case uh, are you trying to enable? Uh, definitely. So we all like to call ourselves uh, uh, Web3. We like to live in metaverse. But the way all of these things manifest is through physical infrastructure, right? And a good property of physical infrastructure is it's inherently decentralized. Uh, because of physics, the world is decentralized. So we thought this is a frontier uh, which uh, aligns with the decentralization ethos. Right? If you think of it other way, for blockchains, dip-ins are a way in which blockchains observe the world through IoT devices. Right? They are the way in which they can actuate the world, and they are the way in which they process the world. So if we were to believe that blockchains are successful, dip-ins are an inherent part of that. That's why we uh, went ahead and uh, built this Dipin AVS. Now, we looked at the current Dipin landscape. You know, Dipins are very deep tech. It's uh, difficult to, because it's infrastructure, uh, it's technically difficult to build them. Uh, they're also, but there's been a lot of innovation that side. Right? Uh, they're also modular. Um, so each Dipin focuses on one specific use case, be it storage, compute, wireless, and so on. What we found to be missing is uh, a layer that brings all dipins together as uh, an economic force. Right? So what we are building at Witness Chain is, this, uh, is a layer to unify dipin economies. So what I mean is, like, just like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum allowed coordination between digital assets and build this whole alternate economy uh, around it, can we do the same for physical assets? And that's what we are uh, achieving with this layer. We have uh, you know, consensus proofs for physical state. So we can prove physical attributes like uh, location, uh, bandwidth, compute performed, and so on. And that can be used to achieve consensus between different entities, whether a physical asset exists or not. 
And then for the downstream, it can be used for uh, financial in instruments to compose multiple DeFi to dip in together, and so on. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, indeed, I think I think for a great point on infrastructure, physical infrastructure by itself is decentralized, and with all these different DPM projects going on, yeah, business uh, chain does fill in the gap of you know how do we have the risking economic model to build the trust um, and be that middle layer between the different protocols. Exactly. Thank you. So um, another example, right? Odd layer. Odd layer also decided to launch a restrict uh, rolled up product. So you know what? Why why did Odd layer choose to do that? Like what additional benefits uh, does that add to users beyond the uh, usual roll up, Dorothy? Yeah, um, I'm gonna make a bold statement here. I would say roll ups today are broken. Um, in Vitalis' <laughs> word, um, roll ups are on training wheels. Um, but in reality, they're, they're centralized. Um, all the rollups you know of today are using centralized sequencer or single sequencer. Um, there are censorship issues, there are bandwidth issue, and some of them don't even have raw proof. Some of them um, have centralized or permissioned um, validator set. Um, these are not um, entirely, um, I would say, decentralized trust. These are um, trust me, bro model um, that's okay with um, probably big brand names like Optimism, Arbitrum. We're happy to trust them because it's hard to believe that they have, they are any in any way incentivized to have any wrongdoing. But when it comes to app rollups or newer blockchains that come out. Um, why, why are we trusting them? Like, I think that's a question everyone has to ask themselves. Um, and that's why at Outlayer, uh, we want to solve this problem by coming up with um, what we call a restay rollup. Um, a restay rollup is not a rollup stack. It's not an OP stack or Arbitrum Orbit. It's not um, a new blockchain. It's a middleware. And it's a middleware that brings trust decentralized trust and security um, to rollups. Um, we use our proprietary technology to essentially decentralize the sequencer and validate us for all the rollups. For, so for, for recent rollups who work with them, um, they can still use Arbitrum Orbit or Polygon CDK. Um, they don't have to invent new roll-up SDKs, they can use the existing infrastructure, but we help them to decentralize all the sequences and validators. So now um, they, can in, they can invite the community or other um, validators who are already servicing Ethereum or other blockchains to join all these roll-ups and provide um, this new security, this new trust model. And there's no better blockchain or better trust system than Ethereum. That's why we are reusing or re-leveraging the eigenlayer restaking mechanism. Um, instead of asking all these rollups to have their own validator program and build everything from scratch, now all these rollups can work directly with all the um, validators and all the e-stakers through eigenlayer. Um, that's what we call restake rollups. All these rollups are secured by ETH assets via restaking, and they're safeguarded by a large set of validators who don't know each other. Um, it's all trustless. And, and now all the communities of these restake rollups can also stake their own ETH assets um, to safeguard all these rollups so they can enjoy the shared um, sequencing revenue, um, and they can also enjoy the staking rewards from providing all these um, staking support. Um, we, we believe this is a much safer and a much trustworthy model than the existing roller world, um, and we're very proud to work with Shuram and uh, all the great builders um, on the stage um, to make it happen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dorothy. It's a very genuine and open sharing. We don't <laughs> usually get that on stage. Uh, thank you, but it's, it's really insightful. Um, so just now, we talk about uh, different projects that all are building on Ethereum. Um, David, so I think you took a very different approach, right? You bring restaking to Bitcoin. You chose a different chain. 
maybe understand like why, like how is Babylon chain dif uh, same or different from Eigenlayer on on Ethereum? What are the different use cases of benefits you're trying to build? Yeah. So uh, thanks for having me here. So okay, before I answer this question, I would like to ask the audience a question. Okay, what is the biggest difference? between Ethereum and Bitcoin? No answer. <laughs> Bitcoin is a little bit older than... Bitcoin is older. No, no, the technology, the technology, the technology uh, not how old pro, they are. Pro, pro, we don't, okay, pro, we don't worry about age here. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very sensitive they, issue. Very anti it's a very sensitive <laughs> issue. <laughs> oh, we, are, we are all very young. <laughs> um, proof of stake and proof of work. Okay, Bitcoin is proof of work and Ethereum is proof of stake. Okay? So that means that ETH always, no matter what you do, has a very native use case. You can do nothing else, but you can stick. In fact, if you think about connection to the financial world, staking, ETH staking is like a risk-free option, the minimum risk of using ETH. Now, Bitcoin is proof of work. So Bitcoin does not have this native use case. So Babylon invented Bitcoin staking to give this use case to Bitcoin. So therefore, the analogy of Babylon is not with Eigenlayer, although I love Sri Ram, <laughs> just like everyone here, but the analogy of Babylon's Bitcoin staking is Ethereum staking. So just like what Shram said earlier, the fundamental primitive of which Eigenlayer is built on is staking. So if you look at his explanation, he sort of with staking. What, only you have staking, then you can have restaking. So what Babylon does is it gives the basic primitive of staking to Bitcoin. Now, you may ask though, wait a minute, this guy David Shea seems to be confusing himself because he just told us that Bitcoin is proof of work. So how can a proof of work chain has a native use case to its asset, which is staking? Now, I just arrived last night. So it could very well be that I'm jet lagging <laughs> and saying something really confusing. Maybe my age is showing or something. Okay, so here's the deal. So Bitcoin is proof of work. And so therefore, it does not need Bitcoin, the asset, to provide security, okay? So what we do at Babylon is to build a proof of stake chain called a Babylon chain, which receives this Bitcoin staking. So therefore, the analogy of Babylon chain and the Babylon protocol is that if you combine Bitcoin with the Babylon chain, with Bitcoin staked on the Babylon chain, then this is equivalent to Ethereum. Now, once you have this staking primitive, Bitcoin staking primitive, then you can do restaking following Shuram's eigenlayer approach. So now you can restake all this Bitcoin, which is staked on the Babylon chain, to any chains or even row up, as um, Dorothy just mentioned to receive Bitcoin staking. So I think that is a good mental picture of what Babylon and what Bitcoin staking is all about. Thank you, thank you, David. Yeah, so I, I, was, a, I was a Bitcoin Maxi, not anymore now, but I mean, I understand how important that we can uh, rely on Bitcoin um, security and therefore we need magician like David to <laughs> basically bring the, the staking model to a proof of work uh, chain. So thank you, thank you very much, David. Um, okay, so why don't we open it uh, up a little bit because we have all this great mind and pioneer in the space, right? So restaking is still a, an early concept, I would say, which is rapidly developing. In your opinion, what is the most exciting uh, development that, that makes you most excited? Yeah. yeah, we started, you know, the conversation is centered very much around the supply side of this market, which is what is happening with the stake. But really, the most exciting thing in my view is what can you do? What does this 
new, what are the new things that this allows? We have a couple of people here who are building new things, uh, services on top. But what is the mental model to think about this? I think the mental model that I like the most is we are converting cloud to crypto. Okay, what do we mean by that? If you look at how web application development uh, looks like back in 1995, the first time when Amazon was trying to build a bookstore, the things you have to do to build a website are you have to first come up with your own server. You know, you have to put your server up. And as your demand scales, you have to buy and put more servers up. It's a very difficult thing to make sure you're scaling with your traffic. The next thing you have to do is to have a login mechanism, identity. Then the next thing you need is a payments mechanism on top of it. The next thing you need is a database which stores all of these things. So these, when you wanted to build Amazon Bookstore online back in 95, you have to build all these things yourself. In 2024, that's no longer the case. This is not how you would build a web application. You would go to Amazon Web Services, use the cloud, so you don't need to put your own hardware. You don't need to build your own identity service on top of the cloud because there are lots of existing software as a service sector, a massive set of services that are already built on the cloud that you can just go integrate. For example, you use OAuth for authorization. You use Stripe for payments. You use MongoDB for databases. And then you wrap all of this together to build whatever application you want on the internet. C crypto application development today is like web application development in 1995. The only option you have is to either go start your own chain or be limited to the very limited parameters of development that a blockchain offers you to build a smart contract on top of existing chains. What we envision as a future forward is when once you have, so the fundamental difference between cloud and crypto is decentralized trust. Cloud plus decentralized trust equals crypto. Crypto minus decentralized trust equals cloud. That's the only difference. So when you want to build new services which use decentralized trust, you can come to a protocol like Eigenlayer, have access to decentralized trust from the Ethereum stakers and the Ethereum operators, and now we can unleash the equivalent of the software as a service economy in the cloud. Now you can come and build services on top of Eigenlayer, each of which solve a specific problem. Like you can build database as a service, you can build identity as a service, you can build Deepin as a service, you can build restake rollups as a service. Each of these services now concatenate when some end user application developer comes in, they can say, I want this identity service, this database service, this AI service, this encrypted computation service, and then integrate all of them to build the end user application. So this is the vision that we're building for. And we're building the foundational building blocks on top of which you can actually express this. Yeah, so um, Shura mentioned decentralized trust. And what we're really excited about at Babylon is to unleash Bitcoin to be a staking asset for the crypto world. And Bitcoin, arguably, is the most decentralized blockchain. And so therefore, it is a good foundation for decentralized trust. Now, why are we so excited about this Bitcoin staking concept? As Shriram said, staking is like a two-sided market. You have the supply and you have the demand. So Bitcoin staking, supply, excitement, is that if you go and ask anybody, what do they do with their Bitcoin? Actually, we were just having a meeting with HashKey, the organizer of this event, just before, and we asked them, hey, what do you do with Bitcoin? You have lots of Bitcoin. I won't tell you how many. But they said, oh, we just put in a cold wallet. That's inevitably the answer to most people, for most people. So what we're doing is we're providing a Ethereum staking energy here for Bitcoin, which is a risk-free yield option 
for Bitcoin. So from a supply side, that's why we're so excited. Now from a demand side, we find Bitcoin a very good staking asset. What do you want to be a staking asset? What's the good property of a staking asset? One very good property is that it should be very less volatile. If you think about native asset, think about like, you know, atom or osmosis, they fluctuate a lot. Do you want your security to be maintained by an asset which fluctuates day by day? Sometimes your market cap could be three times as much as next day, one third the other day. No, you want a relatively stable asset and Bitcoin is a very stable asset, number one. Number two is you want an asset which is very large in supply, which means the cost of capital, the cost of staking capital for chains, row ups, etc., is lower. And so we're really excited about building out this Bitcoin staking product. Yeah, um, from my own perspective, I feel like the most underestimated. Sorry, sorry, guys. I feel like the most underestimated segment within the restaking world is definitely are the actively um, staking services, the AVS, because um, I feel like the cycle, the main theme has been front running. Before the Bitcoin halfling, people been trading with the expectation of uh, Bitcoin halfling. And before the, um, the ETF approval, people have been front running and trading the expect with the expectation that uh, ETF will get approved. Um, and now um, with the anticipation of the whole risk taking ecosystem will flourish, people have been trading all the LRT assets. People being staking into all the LRT protocols, people being front running by saying, we know Eigenlayer will be big, we know restaking will be big. So let's just stake our ease. Before we know what's gonna happen, let's stake our ease without knowing what the yield will be. Let's just ape, right? That's front running. <laughs> and now I think we're approaching the mainnet launch of Eigenlayer and the other mainnet for AVSs, now we'll finally see what the yield will be, how, how this will play out. And um, this is the moment of truth. This is where we can find out with all these is taken into all the LRT tokens or projects, besides the token rewards from the LRT project itself, what else can you get? What are you really in it for? And I feel like this is not talk enough. People are just not talking about it in the market. Um, people on CT are talking about Ether5, Renzo, Puffer, all these projects. But no one is talking about Espresso. No one is talking about um, Witness Chain. No one is talking about Resale Rollup. I feel like this is what the market should be looking at now. You should be paying attention to all the new AV assets that are going live this month and next month. And you should be looking at the real yields that, that are generated by all this issue stake. And you should probably assess the risk that comes with it. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to pause here because I spoke too much. But um, I feel like um, on the ending note, I feel like you should all follow Eigenlayer's Twitter account to watch the mainnet launch. It's scheduled on the 8th. Thank you. But, but I totally agree. I mean, in terms of offer that we're going to have on this stage, I think we are one of the most value creating panels today <laughs> here. Anyway, um, yeah. Yeah, so there's a few things. Uh, one of the first things uh, Shreem talked about AWS. And at the very beginning when we started looking at Eigenlayer and trying to understand it and figure out what actively validated services. Um, the first thing we realized is AVS looks very similar to AWS. It's just the W and the V. We um, are based in swap. Seattle, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that the team is, uh, uh, a lot of the team is in Seattle, we really wondered, uh, what was, it? was that a coincidence or, or not? It, it is a Freudian slip. <laughs> but the point that uh, I'm trying to make there is 
it's actually the most tangible way to think about the value that Eigenlayer is going to bring to the Ethereum ecosystem and to rollups. And at Renzo, we're really excited about two things. Um, Dorothy is spot on. From the very beginning, when we started working on Renzo, we had a go-to-market strategy. And the, the go-to-market strategy was to bootstrap liquidity, to bootstrap the ecosystem, to make the liquidity uh, deep and safe for AVSs to be able to uh, access. But we spent months as a team thinking about how we're going to be able to um, securely uh, secure uh, um, AVSs. And the one piece that's really missing right now, all the LRTs look very similar. And what we're really excited about is to actually start seeing the differentiation between the LRTs. And the way we think about it at Renzo is efficiency. Um, when you have uh, a tech stack that is new like Renzo, Renzo is a brand new project that was built from the ground up. We were able to make a lot of protocol design decisions that we know is going to allow Renzo to be extremely efficient. So not only do you have liquidity, but the way you bring liquidity into AVSs and then return the value back to the stakers, when you have a lot of tech debt and a lot of hum uh, jumps throughout, you actually eat away at those rewards. And it's really important to efficiently bring back um, those, uh, the, the risks that users are taken back to the users that actually deserve it. The second thing we're really excited about is this explosion of, uh, I refer to them as specialty apps that I think we're gonna see with, uh, with roll-up apps. But essentially, we also agree that we think roll-ups and, spe uh, and uh, web apps are gonna get commoditized, right? It's gonna be very cheap and easy to now launch different kind of projects um, on top of Ethereum, whereas before it took a lot of resources and a lot of capital to, to be able to do that. So when you think about the, the users of Eigenlayer, we're still thinking about it uh, with the, with the rollups that exist today, these massive ecosystems that really need to be able to provide a... Um, a lot of different services to be able to monetize the cost that is that was needed to, to launch them like base and OP and Arbitrum. But now we're going to see an explosion of innovation. And that innovation is also going to need different kind of services and ABSs that we can't even fathom today. And you're going to see this, uh, the circle of innovation uh, that we think is going to explode. And at the same time, now that ecosystems like Blast exist, those ecosystems are also going to want an asset that is liquid, that has yield or rewards built into them. And we believe that Easy ETH and Renzo is not only going to be able to provide those services to AVSs, but on the liquidity and the, the distribution side, um, the same projects that are using Eigenlayer are going to want to use Easy ETH as their base liquidity layer. So a lot to, uh, to look forward to and just uh, very thankful to, to have everybody here and uh, all the amazing builders on the stage. Well said. At Witness Chain, uh, what we are most excited about is the programmability, uh, in sec programmable security that Eigenlayer provides. So this will be critical for applications that are built on top of us. So consider a very straightforward application. A dip in wants to sell a dip-in hardware owner wants to sell a futures contract uh, for its setup. Now, the security of that futures contract, which is a DeFi instrument, a dip-in DeFi instrument built on top of us, is tied to how secure the eigenlayer operators are, how much money is backing it, and how applications developers use it, provide a new way in which uh, non-AVSs can also participate in uh, uh, the eigenlayer's security. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, um, researching, seeking great opportunities. There's a lot of that new ABS, new opportunities being brought uh, to the ecosystem. I think um, if you reflect a little bit just now, in the beginning of this panel, we asked like, how many of you have actually stake or restake uh, your token, and we only have half a room there that kind of raised their hand. Um, so can I, can I get, get from each of you, what do you think is the, is the one most critical thing that is currently still lacking before sticking with sticking become
the norm, the majority in the space. It, it should be risk, it could be education, yeah, like what would be your view? Uh, I, you know, I, I think Dorothy highlighted that a bit. Uh, we need actual rewards, right? So people are getting ahead of the skis quite a bit here. We need to make sure that you know, the existing stick supports new innovation and this new innovation actually like, you know, is able to return, you know, meaningful rewards to the users. So that's the next step that we are looking forward to. Uh, it is going to take a lot of time. So we are in this for the long haul it, because, you know, the cloud was not built in a day. Like I, I was talking about 1995 to 2025 now, like 30 years is what it took to build the cloud. We are 10 years, maybe 15 years into the blockchain revolution. It's going to take a, you know, a few years to actually get there. But the promising thing that we are seeing is innovation is what is going to solve this problem. So uh, for us, uh, our goal is to unlock the 1.2 trillion worth of Bitcoin to be a staking asset. And the uh, road is long ahead of us because we have to educate all these Bitcoin holders that staking is actually a very low risk uh, investment, staking. Now, when you tell Bitcoin holders that, hey, the first thing they ask you, the first thing they worry about is slashing. I don't know who came up with this term slashing. <laughs> Whoever came up with this horrible, horrible PR. So, a lot of education ahead of us. Um, I, I would say we need time. Um, or to be more specific, I mean market cycles. And then it's not going to happen within this cycle. It's gonna take a few cycles for people to get really familiar with the idea. It, it's almost like DeFi. Last cycle, when, when um, YFI, Wireing first came out, it's like a simple website with a few buttons. And when we ate him, we were like, oh, this, is, this must be scam, but let's roll with it. And, <laughs> and the, the first minute we mined some Wireing tokens out, we were like, oh, it's scam, let's sell it. Let's market dump. So, so we miss out, a lot of us miss out. Um, the growth afterwards because we felt like there's nothing backing wire in substance, so we sold it too early. And I think it's gonna be the same thing with restaking or Bitcoin staking. At first, people will be skeptical. At first, people will not know how to try it out. Like they wouldn't. They they need a lot of manuals, a lot of guys, a lot of K KOLs assuring them this is safe. And then it's only after they do stake or restake, then they will be like, oh, it, it actually sounds like safe. And then we need to see how slashing plays out. And we need to see how all these AVSs play out, whether the token rewards are really worth the risk. And then next cycle, it becomes a norm. Everyone will be like, oh, restaking, that's safe. I've done that last cycle. It's nothing. Like It's just like... It's just like DeFi today, it's bread and butter in crypto. I think we need time, and time is our friend. Yeah, in my opinion, uh, I think it's builders. Uh, we need more builders. Uh, nine months ago, a small group of us, uh, which is now Renzo, had an idea. Uh, we didn't know how things were gonna play out. We identified a number of problems that we thought we could actually add value. And what's been amazing is everybody here on stage, we're helping each other out. But the more builders that you have, you, the more people you actually have looking at the code, the tech stack, what works, what doesn't work. And it helps to, uh, Shriam talks about infinite sum games. It, it really helps to make the whole ecosystem stronger, more secure, uh, and sticky in, in general. So. Um, one thing that we take pride of at Renzo is we spend an enor enormous amount of time talking to everybody that we can, uh, people that want to build in the space, be advocates, help them, 
uh, navigate all the challenges that we've had, but at the same time be contributors and work with the Eigenlayer team and the Altlayer team and the Witness Chain team to tell them what kind of problems we're having and we need to be able to solve for uh, to make the ecosystem bigger. So um, I encourage everybody, our DMs are literally open. Uh, we have Cam and Krothik here in the, uh, in the crowd from Renzo too. Please come talk to us. We're happy to help uh, everybody. So. Uh, I agree with this. Uh, we need more time. Uh, more time to have new frontiers join uh, Eigenlayer. So right now it's dominated by rollups. We want, uh, like there will be coprocessors, dependents, MPC, so on. New frontiers and also all of those frontiers have to expand. So I think time will uh, take care of that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Indeed, and, and most important of all, we need users, right? So I mean, after today's panel, uh, if you have like 0.1 if, 0.01 BTC or 1 BTC, try to stick it on, on Babylon Chain, on Eigenlayer, on any of the ABS. Get a tangible feel and you will know it is the next big thing. Um, thank you so much for all your time. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for, for your attention too. Um, thank you. Thank you.